Welcome to the Great Loop Radio podcast, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Rousseau. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today, we're continuing our popular story of our loop series, and I've got Bob and Mary Lickfeld with me. They're going to tell you about their great loop, and it's a really interesting story because they came into this as kind of new to boating, and I think a lot of you out there listening are probably in that similar situation, so I thought you would enjoy their story. Before we jump in, I want to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Great Loop Yacht Sales, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. And with the business finished, Bob and Mary, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's great to see you both. I know you are uh, fairly recent Gold Loopers. You finished earlier this year, but let's you know kind of start at the beginning. What was it that made you two decide to do the Loop? We were, well, we have a home in South Carolina and we visited Charleston to uh, Charleston Harbor Resort. And while we were sitting by the pool, someone came by and saw my college t-shirt on and they struck up a conversation. And there was two older gentlemen that were, um, had just started the loop. Um, They told us all about it, just like we've told other people about the loop on on our trip. And it just caught our idea, well, caught my idea of, of, of planning for the future and um, knowing that we never had a boat, knowing that we had never ridden, a, drove a boat before, we thought, well, this is just a dream. Um, but as I look at it more and more and the resources that we had available, we figured we could probably do it. So COVID came along and we bumped up the schedule. Um, we retired early. We both had jobs we enjoyed, but we figured after COVID, this was a good time to do it when we were still young. Um, so we just um, moved forward, bought a boat looked at the details about the perfect boat on the uh, website and bought the boat and started planning. And here we are. Yeah. And I want to talk about what boat you chose. Um, But I also want to ask, you know, what is it sitting at Charleston Harbor Marina or resort to Marina um, and just, you know, talking to two guys that are doing the loop for somebody who's not already a boater, what was it about their story that made you say that's for us, let's do this. Well, the first thing that struck me is they were both very old. I, th- I believe they were in their mid 80s mm-hmm. and there was two guys and they looked like they were they were doing a bucket list and they they were going for it and that attracted to us. It, it sounded challenging, um, but in our, my research, I realized, yeah, it's challenging, but it, it's something that is, is doable and possible. Um, so that was really it. It was just the, the idea that these two old guys were doing it and they looked like they were having a ball. And mm-hmm. um, if they could do it, we could do it. And so we, we we went for it. Yeah. So tell us exactly when you did the loop. You said you kind of sped up the process post COVID, but when did you leave and when did you cross your wake? Well, we bought the boat in um, March of 2022. Uh, Mary had taken a uh, ABC course at the local power squadron. And they said, what kind of boat do you have? And, and she said, I, I'm not 100% sure. We don't have it yet. It's not here yet. <laughs> so um, they, she called me on the phone and we said, you know, it's a 2022 Ranger Tug uh, R27 with a 300 horsepower outboard engine. So she told him we were leaving for the, for the loop the following month. I mean, in March when we were getting the boat in February. And they said, no, you're not. So they talked us into joining the squadron. Um, gave us education, um, went out on trips with us, came to our boat and helped us with training. Um, so it was a, it was a, a a changing moment for us to decide, hey, we better wait and take advantage of all this opportunity that we have with this power squadron. So uh, we left uh, in March. Um, I'm sorry, April third of 2023, mm-hmm. and we finished about a week shy of a year uh, on March 26th of 2024. Excellent. And I I love that part of your story because, uh, you know, two things I think you did very much right there. And I'm by no means, you know, the sayer of what is the right way because everybody needs to do it their own way. But I think for people who are newer to boating, I think the size boat you chose was wise. 
first right. of all, um, because a little bit easier to manage, but getting that education and the power squadron is a great place to get started. Um, and realizing what a resource you had there is yeah. really important. So, um, you know, tell us, you know, Mary, I know, uh, Bob mentioned you took the class. Um, did you both continue with classes or through the power squadron or was it more, um, through their activities that you really kind of absorbed all the knowledge? We both took other classes. We took, um, Piloting we and took piloting. It, um, navigation and advanced navigation and weather, weather. Uh, electro, marine electronics. And um, there was one other, oh, seamanship. The, mm -hmm. the seamanship one was really the, the, the starting point for us. So, yeah. Yeah. They're a great resource. And for anybody mm -hmm. listening who's not familiar with the Power Squadrons, they now are marketed as America's Boating Club. That's and there correct. are chapters all over the country, um, even in, you know, small lakes that you wouldn't expect to have that kind of a resource. So the classes are fabulous. Um, definitely a great place to start or enhance your boating education, even if you've right. already been a boater. And um, we took those classes with the instructor, but um, they're also, I think some of them are offered online also. So you're right. Definitely. And I'm not sure which, but yes, I have seen some of them online and that's a good tip. And we should also put out there while we're talking about the, the power squadron, um, and America's boating class, uh, Americans, uh, the power squadron, Americans, America's boating club has the NASBLA approved basic mm -hmm. boating course. So for anybody listening, if you're planning to do the great loop, there are an increasing number of states on the loop that require you to have taken a NASBLA approved course. So it's NASBLA.org, NASBLA.org. Go there, click on your home state, and you can see where you can take the course. But there are a few states now on the loop that even for boaters transiting through, they must have taken that NASBLA course. So I'm trying to get the word out about that to people because Alabama just added that actually. And you actually spend a good bit of time in Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> Once you uh, kind of familiarize yourself with the Great Loop route, you'll realize you're a couple of weeks probably in Alabama. So definitely get the education. Um, so you picked the, R the Ranger R27 and you mentioned that um, you you brought that new. Um, yeah. What was it about the R27 that felt like the right boat for you? Well, for the reasons you said, um, it, it had a low... Um, uh, clearance. It had a, a very small draft. Um, it um, it we didn't realize it at the time, but it it went fast, um, which I, we will talk about that later. But it came in handy so many times on, along the route. But even when we were talking with the salesman, yeah, he basically looked at Mary and said, "Mary, if there's a thunderstorm and it's over here, you'll be able to get home a lot faster than other people will be able to get home. And that sort of was, you know, comforting to know that. But mm -hmm. uh, also the economy of the uh, fuel um, and the uh, marina cost, we figure we're all going to be lower by having a smaller boat. And, you know, fortunately, many nobody turned us away. Whenever we needed a slip, um, we rarely ever had a no because they said, we'll just put you at the fuel dock, mm -hmm. which trust me, we loved not having to wind our way. Right. Into a market. <laughs> we were very happy being out on the fuel dock. So. Right. Yeah. So, and the, um, the R27 is an outboard, correct? Correct. Yeah. And that, um, has really become popular. Even, you know, the, the size boat that comes with outboards is ticking up. Um, yeah. we see a lot of people really opting for the ease of maintenance on those, is the maintenance something you did yourself or that you brought somebody in to do? Um, not extremely handy, but I did have other loopers that actually helped me do one oil change on it. But most of the time we had to have the boat pulled because you had to uh, change the oil in the lower unit every hundred mm -hmm. hours. So a lot of that, when I said, you know, it came into going fast, sometimes we would, we would go fast because we didn't want to putz along at seven miles an hour while we knew what we had you know a seven hour trip when we could do it in two mm -hmm. um because we were building up hours on the uh on the service requirement so cutting costs on the service was you know if 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 we, we could and when it was appropriate we would go faster and take an outside route perhaps um to keep our costs down for the for the maintenance and the ease of it because there wasn't a whole lot of places especially on the hudson river that were willing to do an oil change in um in june uh, June, July, it was tough for us to find a place to do it. We actually run up to go into uh, Liberty Landing and have it done. So mm -hmm. not by choice. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about your, your general cruising preferences. And what I mean by that is, you know, how fast did you prefer to travel? How many miles 
was your preference? And we all know there's exceptions on certain right. days to that. You know, did you tend to anchor out or go to marinas? What was, was kind of your sweet spot for all those things? Um, 50 to 80 miles was our sweet spot. We certainly extended that mileage um, a couple of times um, when we wanted to go outside or we went back longer. Um, we, we didn't realize it until we got going that um, when we, when we, when we got up on plane and went across the Albemarle, Albemarle Sound, for example, in the beginning of the trip, it was a lot more comfortable going up on plane and getting across the Albemarle Sound in 35 minutes than it would have been going at seven or eight miles an hour and taking two or three hours, three or three hours to get across, whatever mm -hmm. it would have been. So um, we also realized that our fuel economy was the same going 29 miles an hour up on plane that it was um, going nine miles an hour, um, not wow. on plane. So when it was appropriate and when we thought it was the conditions were right, we got up on plane and went more often than not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is the fuel economy for your uh, We were getting 1.2 uh, miles a gallon mm -hmm. or mile, miles per gallon when we were going along at nine miles an hour and at 29 miles an hour. If we cut it back to 17 miles an hour, 18 mm -hmm. miles an hour, we were getting between 1.4 and 1.6 miles per gallon. Mm -hmm. So and I think it all averaged out. We were, we averaged out at uh, 10.7 miles an hour at about 1.4 gallons, miles per gallon. Excellent. That's really helpful information because we get those questions a lot. Yep. And diesel or gasoline? It's gasoline. Yeah. Gasoline. Okay. That, that always helps for people to kind of understand the specs. Um, did you tend to mostly do marinas or mostly anchor or some of well, I think everyone's goal is to anchor out as much as possible. But we, um, our, our dinghy was a tacky cat, which was inside the center console. So we had to plan ahead if we were going to anchor out and, and have the boat blown up and, and pulled along with us. Um, I did not get a, a dinghy lift because it, you know one, one ranger blocked the view of the back. So I just said, we'll pull it when we, when we want to. So knowing that it was a process, we, we, and knowing that the cost of marinas was um, for a 30 foot LOA boat was a lot less than a 52 foot boat. For sure. A lot of times with the convenience of going into the marina and hooking up the power and having air conditioning, having the ability to go into town and not have to take care of putting the, uh, putting the ding, blowing up the dinghy and getting it set up. Um, we anchored, uh, we went to marinas more often than not. Yeah. Um, so, sometimes when we did anchor um, going down the river system, um, we had friends that had bigger boats and were welcoming us to, to, um, uh, raft up, which, yeah. you know, we loved. I mean, it was very communal. We had three or four boats in a row and we got a chance to, to hang out at night and enjoy it without the stress of worrying about the anchoring part. And, you know, they were very happy to have us along. So, yeah, excellent. That's, that's the way to do it. Um, yeah. I know you also said you didn't, you tended to kind of, um, pull into marinas when you expected, to stay for some time, you know, you didn't typically pull in late in the day and leave the next morning. Yeah. Reasons for that? We um, we were not rushing through the trip, and we mm -hmm. did. We wanted to make sure that we we had a rule that we weren't going to leave a marina after one day. So we it was easy. You typically a two, three, four day trip, um, and we as soon as we got there, we prepared the boat for the next trip and washed it down, and immediately got our bikes off. And we were in town and we, mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time going to uh, American Legion halls, um, out to see music. Uh, we saw it entertainment almost every town we went to. Um, and then we started, uh, we got into it volunteering. So we started looking for volunteer opportunities as well. So we basically did not want to just rush through and, you know, go to a town and, and, and just see the marina. We wanted to see everything. Yeah. And that, that's, you know, frankly, I believe one of the, bigger benefits to having a fast boat besides everything you already talked about. Right. Um, but, you know, for some people, the boat and being on the boat and being on the water is the whole experience. And for others right. exploring shoreside, you know, the boat is the way to get to the next interesting mm -hmm. town to yeah. see. So if you're in that second category, a faster boat that lets you cover the same distance in less time means you have more hours on yeah. shore to really kind of explore the other things that are out there to see. So right. again, it's a personal preference thing, but, um, yep. you know, I think, some people who um, look at fast boats and think, well, that's just too fast to do it, um, don't realize the upside of that 
which yeah. is <laughs> and i saw you you went awfully fast too sometimes because you were on a schedule when i, we did I sometimes. followed your credit because an idea of this so yep we had the dreaded schedule and um yeah. you know that comes with us both working aboard and one of the things that worked out very nicely for me is a lot of times when we were going fast, it was to get to somewhere that Michael could fly out of from an airport. Right. Um, but when he would fly out, I was still on the boat. So I got plenty of time in the marinas to explore, gotcha. you know, he'd be gone for a couple of days at a time. Um, so it worked for us and everybody's yeah. different. I know there certainly are people who would not want to travel as fast or as big hops as we occasionally did. Right. Um, but it worked for oh. us and I'm grateful we got to do it while still working and hope to do it yeah. again in a different way once we retire so that we can yeah. kind of, you know, experience it in that way as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't feel like we missed out on any of the stops that we, I mean, sometimes we skipped over a stop, um, especially in the beginning of the trip. Um, we skipped over some just for, you know, we were felt like we were falling behind because we were new. Um, but I don't think we skipped over a spot. We just got there faster, you know? Yeah. You know, Michael has said to me so many times, everybody's used to traveling at highway speed, you know, 70 miles an hour or something. So he's like, I guarantee that we saw everything on the water at 15 knots as people saw if they were going seven knots, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're still going at a pretty slow pace, even if on the water, it's considered a fast boat, but, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, to each their own for sure. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, okay. I want to talk a little bit, you know, we've talked about some of the practical things, the boat, you know, your cruising preferences. I want to talk about some of the more um, intangibles, like what this meant to you. Um, you know, I know you were new and, and that was stressful for you in some cases. And I also want to talk about some of the music festivals you visited and the volunteering, because I think those are really interesting ways that you made this your own trip. So we'll take a break and we'll be back in a moment. BJ's Cove is a free streaming radio station that is redefining Yacht Rock for loopers and people who have actually been on a boat. Are you bored listening to 40 songs on repeat? Do you think boaters never play Jimmy Buffett? Are you tired of people with no boating, fishing, or sailing experience telling you what is and isn't your kind of music? No worries. BJ, your first mate at BJ's Cove has spent 60 years boating and partying on the water, and she will play real yacht rock just for you. Join us at BJsCove.com to find out how to listen. Did you know that every mile of the Great Loop is covered by Skipper Bob guides? Its mile-by-mile -mile format is a great planning tool and essential at the helm. On the most popular routes and side trips, Skipper Bob covers preparation, navigation, bridges and locks, and the best places to visit. Skipper Bob guides are updated each year, and its website keeps you current with navigation alerts and cruising news. To check it out, go to skipperbob.net. Skipper Bob is a proud Admiral sponsor of AGLCA. We're back on the Great Loop Radio podcast. Today we are featuring, again, one of our gold looper couples sharing the story of their loop. So we are here with Bob and Mary Lickfeld, and they did the loop on a Ranger R27. Uh, so tell us a little bit, you've already shared, you were kind of brand new to boating when you got the boat, you spent a year getting some education and getting familiar with the boat, but you still uh, felt like there were things you didn't know when you left, which trust me, everybody feels like that on the Great Loop. Um, but talk about, you know, kind of the difference between your expectations and what the reality was when you actually dropped those lines and started the loop. Well, obviously it was scary, right? So the <laughs> first, the first, uh, well, the power squadron that we talked about, they had a great send off for us. Um, the first night we drove to Little River, I mean, to Little River from Myrtle Beach, and they had a big dinner for us. The next day, they actually traveled with us to Southport on their boats. Wow, nice. We had lunch. So mm -hmm. it was a nice, very nice send off. So that it gave us a little comfort. Reality hit the next morning. We woke up to dense fog and couldn't see anything, you know, 50 feet in front of us. And we had the Cape Fear River in front of us um, and snow's cut, you know, so we're, we're panicking already. <laughs> um, but that was the first time we went a little faster up the Cape River River and realized that, you know, we weren't going to die going, you know, that fast up the river. Um, we pulled into, um, oh, and that's where I lost my, I broke a tooth the first, second day of the trip. So I had to find a, a dentist somewhere mm -hmm. down the line rather than turn around and going back. So all those things that added up to stress, um, we got rain delayed in Carolina Beach. So, um, so re really, it started out very stressful. And as we experienced new things, you know, we had the fog, we had the big water, then we had the Abermarle Sound, then we had the, the Chesapeake Bay. All those things were very fearful on paper. 
Um, in reality, they weren't as bad as they as we thought they were. It's just the worry of every new step. And once you cross all those new steps and and new experiences, it became more commonplace. And when you saw it again, when you saw another body of big water, you know, it wasn't as big and scary as it was the first time around. So, yeah. but so, it was stressful. Yeah. yeah. How long would you say it took you to just, you know, kind of find the groove where it wasn't so stressful each day as you were experiencing something new? Uh, I think the Erie Canal actually helped mm -hmm. a lot because at that point you were, you were in calmer water, you were going from stop to stop and you had more of a support system because mm -hmm. you were living with people, you know, on the wall, you know, every night. So I think the Erie Canal is where we hit our groove um, and we spent the whole month of July pretty much doing the Erie Canal because we, we were going to uh, the Oswego Music Fest. Mm -hmm. So basically we slow rolled it a little bit there and enjoyed it and we had a good time. And sometimes when you get off the boat for a while or, you, or you're going, you know, very easy trips, um, some of the stress you forget about, you know. Yeah. How about you, Mary? When, how long did it take you to kind of feel like you were in the groove with the, the constant pace of this and doing new things all the time? Um, I would say about the same time. It was yeah. when we slowed down a little bit and had that month where things were pretty much um, consistent every day. We'd go, go through some locks, pull over around that time too, all set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those of you who haven't looped, it's pretty common. A lot of loopers for you, it was the Erie Canal, but it sounds like based on your time frames, that was probably two to three months into the yeah, trip. Three months in, yeah. um, and that seems to be that magic number. You know, I encourage everybody who's finding it stressful to give it at least two months, maybe three. And it really just seems to take that long to find your groove. And for you, it was the locking through, which for a lot of people, that sounds super stressful. Um, mm -hmm. But, it, and again, if you haven't done it, you don't realize that you're locking through with the same group of boats. Um, it's a slow day as you're waiting for locks. And um, in those particular locks on the Erie Canal, the boats are packed in pretty close together. So you can mm -hmm. chat with other people while you're doing it. Yeah. Um, and that's where the relationships start to form. So I think you had kind of the double, um, the double benefit of having the time under your belt at that point, and also hitting a portion of the route where those kinds of, those kinds of friendships form. But I know you, you have said, you know, there's a few things you really enjoyed doing along the way. And one of those is experiencing live music. So tell us about some of the, the festivals and other events that you were able to attend. Well, so uh, most of the planning part of the trip is, you know, I'm, I'm only looking at your YouTube videos and, and trying to get the route down. And then I'm looking for marinas and then I'm trying to watch the weather. Mary was really looking at um, you know, where are we going? Well, we're going to be in Oswego. Well, there's a music fest at the end of July. Mm -hmm. So we go online, we buy tickets or whatever we had to do or make reservations. And then that was our, our goal to get there. Um, but we basically did that at, at every stop. If we knew we were going to, um, you know, water, water for New York, we would be online looking, you know, a week ahead of time, what, what's going on in that town. Uh, Tour New York had a big arts festival while we were there. New Bern had a big arts festival while we were there. Um, and then we also had bigger goals, like we definitely wanted to go to Nashville for live music. So we stopped at uh, Green Turtle Bay, left the boat there for a week and had service and rented a car and went in. Uh, Muscle Shoals was another big, uh, big spot that we wanted to get to. And of course, um, Key West um, was a goal. And we were there for, we were supposed to go for one month and the winds were bad. So we said, let's stay another month. And we did all the music festivals and and had a great time. And then finally, Savannah was our final goal for St. Patrick's Day. So right. we hit all the things that we really wanted to do, the the must-haves, and yeah. we had a great time. Yeah. Well, and I get this question a lot: is you know, how do you plan to hit these things when you're not supposed to have a schedule? But so it sounds like for you, it worked pretty well to except for the major things like Key West, um, yeah. it sounds like you planned where you would be and then found the music to go along with it as That's opposed correct. to here's a music festival. How do we get there at the right time? Right. So that probably even, saves even, a lot of stress. <laughs> even Nashville was the same way. I mean, we didn't plan any, we didn't make any hotel reservations or rent cars until we knew we were in Paducah and we we're a couple of days away. So. Right. Yeah. That, that's the easier way to do it for sure. The other thing I know that you, um, found ways to do was volunteer along the way. Um, and that's something that there have been, you know, several looper couples who have done, uh, but I think not enough myself included. And I think once you get started, it's a surprisingly very busy lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and that makes it challenging, but you found a way to do it. So tell us a little bit about the types of volunteer opportunities that you found out there. 
So, so um, our first opportunity was at the um, American Legion in Mackinac City, and we saw they were having a hot dog sale. And um, what weekend was it? It was a holiday weekend, Memorial Day mm -hmm. weekend, or something. And they said volunteers needed, so we signed up. And basically, we went that day. We met the crew that was working with us, and we were there for the rest of the week and we continually saw those people and met the people in other events. The, the Mackinac Bridge Walk, mm -hmm. some of the people from the Legion also were in the fire company and they were they were working in that thing. So we, it was like a fun event where we did it, we put our four or five hours in and then we had friends with friends for the rest of the week, basically. Mm -hmm. um, we did a uh, church festival in Cape Coral where my cousin uh, you know, said, hey, you can come visit us. We parked at their dock. So you can come visit us, but we have to work the festival this week. And we said, well, we can volunteer. And they said, yes. Yeah. So they put us um, in um, in the live nativity in shepherd's outfits. <laughs> that, it was quite an experience. So, I bet it was. Yeah. And in Key are... West, we did with Key West. We were there for two months and we hooked up with a, there was a group of uh, ex-military people that were staying at the um, campground near us. Mm -hmm. And we met up with them at the, we volunteered for the half marathon. And then they introduced us to a whole opportunity of other uh, events that needed volunteers. And so we did a uh, Valentine's Day um, a race, a, um, a um, Wesley House Adoption Center Family Services had a, uh, an elaborate affair on um, Valentine's night. And then the music festival needed volunteers. So we volunteered for the, uh, for the Country Western um, Festival and the Miles Zero Festival. So yeah. Such a great way to get involved and kind of immersed in the communities you're yeah. visiting. So I absolutely love that, you know, finding and a way to pay friends, it forward. Yeah. Friend, friends other than, you know, nothing against voters, but we had friends other than voters that we were interacting with. So yeah. it was good. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely fabulous. I love, I love the way you did that. Um, the trip was also not without its stresses and you were pretty frank about that in some of your pre-interview yeah. questions. Um, you know, so tell us about those, the most stressful things. And you've already kind of shared the newness yeah. of things, but um, a, a couple multi-part question, <laughs> you know, what were some of those stresses? How did you overcome them? And then what was that like to, once you got past them? Well, the stressors were, you know, what I described, like mm -hmm. every day it was something new that we, had, we as new voters had never experienced before. So the only way to get over it was to continue moving forward. But that wasn't without, you know, hey, I didn't eat breakfast today because I'm too nervous to start the boat and I'm, we're going. And then, you know, five hours later, we still haven't eaten lunch. So, um, you know, it, it, it just the everyday grind of it until you got comfortable was very difficult. And I, mm -hmm. and I think I told you, I, I lost close to 50. I didn't know how much weight I lost. We didn't, we didn't weigh ourselves until Petoskey, Michigan. Petoskey, mm -hmm. but th when we found out, I lost close to 50 pounds. Then she started, um, you know, you're sick. And we started buying donuts by the bag. Every, every day <laughs> we, had, we had snacks and stuff on the boat because she just wanted me to eat more and keep, mm -hmm. keep to get my weight back. So, mm -hmm. so uh, overall, it was a good thing. I wasn't sick. It was just a little bit of stress and losing 50 pounds was, uh, you know, one of the added benefits of the trip. So, but again, once it got easier and once we experienced more things, um, you know, the stress level went down and it just all plateaued out and we had a great time, you know, yeah. we had a great time while we were stressed, but, you know, starting the engine in the morning and leaving the dock or coming into a, dock, a marina at the end of the day, those were very stressful times a little bit in the beginning. So. Docking was the most stressful yeah. and um, every time you went in, there were different instructions and they would tell us to go by these certain boats. We don't even know the names yeah. of boats. So, right. Uh, then I started like frantically writing down the instructions because then Bob would say, what did he say? And then we learned quickly that I should write down everything he said because in the moment when you're so stressed, yeah. uh, it, you could, I don't know, it was ever crazy every time we went into a different marina. So No, it's a great tip to write it down. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great tip. Absolutely. And, and ask him twice. All right, you told us this kind of boat. We don't know what that is. What color, at least tell us what color. Like, of course, <laughs> most of the time they were white. So they right. <laughs> well, so... And, you know, nothing <laughs> worth doing is, is without its challenges, so to speak. So what did you gain from completing the Great Loop? Well, I just, um, uh, I, I think the satisfaction of, of doing it 
and accomplishing it and something you've been talking about for years uh, with mm-hmm. your family and they get sick of hearing about it. <laughs> it's just when you, when you finish it. So that same power squadron group that we, that sent us off, mm-hmm. um, when we came back, um, our children came down from up north and, and met us at the marina, surprised us, right? And uh, the power squadron was all there. Uh, other loopers that had lived in this area were there to celebrate with us and the local news media. So we pulled in that into the marina to 50 people. Wow. Uh, steering us on and it was overwhelming and it just made it was very satisfying to know that you finished up and other people who, who were part of the journey were there to celebrate with you. Yeah. yeah, that's that's an amazing end to the journey. So yeah. as we start to wrap up, I always like to kind of finish with what advice you would have, you know, for somebody who's in the same position you were if around 2022, just you know, buying the boat, right. maybe without a lot of experience and is thinking about doing the loop, what would you tell them? Well, I, I think we touched on something. You need preparation. I mean, you mm-hmm. never, you'll be much more comfortable if you prepare and get education and get some hours in on the boat before you, before you take off. And um, it just makes everything a lot more comfortable. Um, don't pull into the marina at night and leave the next morning if you can help it. You know, just go and immerse yourself in the community and find out what, you know, we learned so much about history and, and, the, and the bike trail systems all around the country. I mean, we, we saw a lot of stuff that you, I think we hit 117 different cities. So you see so much and you learn so much and you meet so many nice people who want to know what you're doing and, and are very often, you know, wanting to help you. Um, and third thing is, you know, just have fun. Don't be on schedule and have fun. So. Excellent. Anything from you, Mary, that you would want to tell somebody new to this idea? Um, I think, um, along the going, um, being prepared, you could be an expert in the ICW near Myrtle beach in the water, but you've never been in the, uh, uh, Lake Michigan or on the, doing the locks, doing locks. like mm-hmm. just prepare for everything because even though even if you are an experienced voter and you've been voting all your life there's so many new things that you haven't experienced because every day was different every water every waterway we went on was different tides Mm -hmm. were different Uh, different places yeah different conditions in every spot so just be aware of it besides the planning of the dates and when you think you're going to be places you have to know about the areas that you're traveling too. And one other thing that we did was um, Bob always made sure to look at what the weather was when we were leaving and what it was going to be a couple hours later when we arrived, because sometimes you might get there and it will be so windy you can't get into your spot when you should have waited till the next day yeah. or to, for a bad weather. So. We were very conservative in that regard. So. Yeah. Well, and that's a great way to be yeah. if you're feeling new at it and feeling a little bit stressed. And uh, Mary, I love what you said about being prepared because um, I think that can help reduce the stress. If you actually Mm -hmm. look over the route of where you're going to be that day and are prepared for the locks and what kind of tie-offs the locks have. And, you know, if there's any notes in any of the cruising guides about which side you typically tie up on at that lock for me and and coming into marinas too, any advanced information I have gave me a little bit more peace of mind. So I love that you, you said be prepared because that was also my motto. So Uh, that was another thing we did um, back to the tips. Um, We would look at Marina maps. We would look Mm -hmm. up the map of the Marina we were going to and ask them what slip slip we were going to. So that gave us a better, after a couple of times and not knowing when I got in there and being so stressful, we decided to start getting more information about the Marina. Yes. Site map was the best thing, yeah. I think, to yeah. look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, excellent. Great information. Bob and Mary Lickfeld, thank you for joining me today. And uh, thank, thank you. you for doing your great loop and sharing with us the details. We appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you for your help. Thank I you. We very much appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And thanks to everyone who's watched or listened today. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Great Loop Radio podcast. Until then, safe cruising. <laughs>